beginning. We all come to a story with hopes and expectations, looking for an answer. Sometimes it would be better to live with that hope without ever knowing the full story. My biggest problem with horror games is usually the narrow definition they have of fear. Jump scares, gloomy ambiances, and gory death animations don't really do it for me. There's only so far they can get you. I could say that I find the theme of fear more interesting than being scared. Because I am a coward. And so when I heard deep praises about Alan Wake 2, a survival horror game that, from what I heard, elevated our art form to new heights, I decided to explore Remedy's universe by going through their three games that share a common story. And I'm really glad I did because it showed me the journey of an artist mastering its voice. Sam Lake developed such a unique signature that I see his work as rivaling the likes of Hideo Kojima or Yoko Taro. With the character of Alan Wake, an author that seems to be trapped in his own story, Remedy opened up the genre to explore a story about stories. It's a writing style that is anxiously self-aware and the meta-narrative becomes part of what creates fear. By blurring the lines between truth and fiction, not only for the character but also for the player, the sense of horror becomes pernicious, ominous, intimate. Sure, Alan Wake 2 still uses the classic tools we listed before, but even they feel part of that larger sense of dread, acting more like a poison slowly gaining ground in our veins instead of the shocking bludgeoning of a hammer. Alan Wake 2 is an art piece that is the culmination of the work done in Remedy's earlier games, and in that sense we will have to look back at the first Alan Wake as well as Control, to understand the gems they uncovered, but also the qualities they lacked. And that way we will truly be able to grasp the genius of that last opus, how they found a way to push their art further and truly touch a deeper notion of horror through the meta-narration how they managed to create a story about stories. I'm losing myself. I have to fight it. I have to remember the clicker, the light switch. I lost it, but I have the lamp now. Remedy's universe is singular in the way it merged together many inspirations from the horror catalog. The first Alan Wake somehow feels like a blend of old authors like Edgar Allan Poe or Guy de Maupassant mixed with an aesthetic from the 2000s horror movies. It's more of a personal story, while Control is way more about world building. It draws from the otherworldly and esoteric conceptualization of Lovecraft, but also the way shows like X Files created this governmental counterbalance to the supernatural forces of this world. Alan Wake is Remedy's world at the micro scale, and Control is more about the macro. And in that sense, Remedy's universe shares a quality with the MCU, where one world gets to be explored through different tones and perspectives. It's really compelling and each game builds upon the last. But no matter the angle, the studio always builds on mystery to create their stories. And they often do it by blurring the lines between reality and fiction, the mundane and the cosmic, the obvious and the obscure. The first Alan Wake uses the classic horror trope of the protagonist who doesn't know if he is crazy or not. As the adventure goes on, you keep finding pages of a manuscript you apparently wrote, but from which you have no memory. Sometimes it retells in disarming detail something you just went through, and other times it describes what is about to happen. It could be cliché, but the writing and narration are actually at the top of their game. They really fit the tone, they add a literary sensibility that elevates the experience. So it's a video game, but it draws from literature, already blending the two. But on top of that, there's another stylistic choice that Remedy uses that's really interesting. They have a couple of TVs playing old sci-fi horror shows a la Twilight Zone. They are just running the shows, nothing forces you to look at it or to listen. It's not a cutscene or even directly related to the plot. And what's really interesting is that it's actually shot. It's a live-action short movie they made and that put into the game adding another layer of artistic language. It really adds the feeling of not quite being in a real world. It's weird, it's out of place. It's like the horror version of the feeling you had when you were a kid and you ran into your teacher outside of school. It's both familiar and yet completely incongruous. Draw in some mythological references to Thor and Odin and you could even add old tales and folklore to the index. 
Alan Wake seemed to draw from everything that touched Sam Slake's sensibility. And this way of presenting his game was only in its infancy in the first Alan Wake. It's imperfect. It has unimpressive gameplay, but even then Remedy's ability to create powerful moments and images, one you wouldn't see from any other studio, was already quite strong. Control took that and really pushed it a step further. The presentation of its world is astounding. The meeting between the cold, brutalist governmental building and the Lovecraftian architectural experience is simply one of the best art direction I've ever seen. Everything is a concept or an idea. Your weapon, a shape-shifting supernatural gun, is in fact Excalibur, just its incarnation in our era. The world is about these incarnated ideas and feelings, like the place where the game is set in, the headquarters of the Federal Bureau of Control, the oldest house. A never moving and changing building that reminds us of the house in the Order of the Phoenix mixed with the requirement room. It's somewhat alive, it has a consciousness of its own and it's not bound by any sense of geometry. And Control also used a lot of live action cinematography, sometimes for small video productions, other times as overlaid images difficult to discern which leaves an impression of something not being quite right due to its superposition with a 3D modeled world. The general feeling of the place and the events of the game are magical but treated as just another day at a government job by the characters. They all are amazingly chill with what is going on. And even though I understand the feeling they were trying to evoke, where what would seem as a cataclysm is just another day for the FBC, I think it controls Achilles' heel. Characters, including our protagonists, lack substance. They don't seem to feel that much. They are just a little bit offbeat to add to the aura of uneasiness and mystery, but by overdoing it a little, I think Remedy missed the mark. The contrast with the first Alan Wake is pretty clear there. Control's gameplay is really compelling and the world building is at the forefront, but it lacked the charm and flair of the more intimate and character-centric experience that was Alan Wake. We could say one was more about the lore, while the other was more about the story. And so, with Alan Wake 2, they wielded those two elements fully. Both games served as building blocks upon which they could begin their story, but also as experiments that clearly got Remedy to master its voice. Sam Lake had been toying with groundbreaking ideas for decades now, and it was time for him to show off just how great of an artist he was. Genres are quite interesting. They are a categorization of experiences, a way for us to draw the frontiers of a certain style. It carries certain expectations, some things we could almost call rules. It's tropes and themes. You don't go see a rom-com without expecting it to talk about love and without a first date that doesn't go as planned. And you don't expect a horror game not to be about fear and not to include a jump scare or two or eight. But then, the more genre is explored, the more some of the conventions become routine, which can be good or bad. Sometimes it loses its charm because you've seen the normal looking person who ends up being a zombie when you get closer, classic just a bit too much. Other times, these expectations can be tools. An innocent looking empty always feels oppressive in a horror game if you think it is a horror game. Just look at the recent release, Pools how it creates a sense of dread without ever showing you anything close to threatening. In these cases, you know you are supposed to feel fear, and so any sense of safety invokes the opposite. Expectations feed the imagination, it's not just you and the game, it's you, the game and your prior knowledge of the genre. Alan Wake 2 exploits this love triangle really well. We've already discussed how Remedy's usage of different mediums coming from different art forms creates an atmosphere that is disconcerting. But the game being a story about a man trapped in a story, all the live action elements which are now put at the forefront also act as red herrings. Because the whole time you've got to ask yourself, does this mean anything? What is weird for weird's sake and what is actually a clue? And that simple process of the mind us seeking an answer to a mystery we can hardly outline. 
is essentially a part of what makes Alan Wake 2 a fantastic horror game. It goes beyond the classic trope of the character not trusting its own reality. It relays that feeling to us too. The whole time as I was playing, I half expected Alan Wake to look back at me in the camera and be horrified by my presence. And the narrative structure where you choose which story to follow, sagas or Alan's, can make you feel like maybe it has consequences. What if you did something out of order? What if you missed something? It enhances the feeling of discomfort while being a great tool for pacing, mixing up the gameplay from Saga's investigation to Alan's exploration at your own rhythm is good for the story, the atmosphere, and makes the gameplay feel less repetitive. A simple, elegant, and very effective mechanic. In general, games want to use your prior knowledge to ease you into the experience. But I've known a select few games that really use my own knowledge of gaming against me. In the horror genre, in which I'm no expert, I only have Inscription in mind, maybe a bit Soma, for what could rival what Remedy has laid out for us. Both these games toy with you because you think you know how games work, not just horror stories. It's beyond subversion of expectations, it's two pieces of art that are trying to redefine expectations, trying to take the genre elsewhere. But what really did it for me, what convinced me of doing this video, was the ending of the game. Just to put you in the right mindset, let's just summarize quickly the Alan Wake story. The first game shows our titular writer fighting off a supernatural force based in darkness that we will eventually know to be the Dark Presence. It's an entity belonging to a different dimension that tries to find its way into our worlds through artists, in this case our very own Alan Wake. And so it captures him and forces him to write a story where the Dark Presence gets to get out. The line between reality and fiction is fractured, the writing and the events are superposed and, long story short, Alan Wake eventually traps himself into the lake with the Dark Presence and through his sacrifice, saves the day. The sequel is set 13 years later, and Alan Wake finally emerges from the lake for a second round against the Dark Presence. There's a big mystery, plenty of compelling characters, but in the end it's about Alan's attempt at writing a story that finally gets rid of the Dark Presence, which, in this game, is embodied by Scratch, a shadow that invades anyone's body and controls them. That's the setup. But again, this story is not only the story of the video game, it's the one that Alan is writing. And so, in a very unique way, the character and the actual writers of the game are put in front of the same question. How do you write an ending that's earned? Because if it's not good, if it's just and they lived happily ever after, the story wouldn't respect the horror genre and would fail to be strong enough to defeat Scratch. And horror stories, they don't end well. You don't need to tell me this is a horror story. Right. The ending has to fit the genre if it's going to work. In a horror story, they're only victims and monsters. Victims and monsters. This stuck with me deeply. Our stories are the opposite of empowerment. They are unfair, brutal, hopeless. But it's not just that it is what they are, it's what they are about. These also are the themes of the genre. And I think I never truly connected with most horror stories because I never understood that before playing Alan Wake 2. They are, ironically, about the lack of control. How humans can be put into submission by anything. The monsters of the horror genre are just a reflection of accidents and diseases. They embody what we just have to suffer through without any, and I get now the beauty of this trilogy, control. And art that deals with our powerlessness is usually my cup of tea, and no games did it as directly as this game. And the genius twist in all of this is the profound horror that lies in the fact that Alan Wake has to choose to write a story where he pays the heavy price. We're figuring out the ending I need to write. If there is a hero, they will ultimately pay a heavy price. I genuinely thought for a while that we would be presented with a choice. A choice between a couple of endings that could be written, 
that would range from happily ever after to everybody dying in horrible circumstances. And that we would have to find the right line where our characters lose enough for it to be a horror story, for our heroes to pay enough of a heavy price, but that would keep enough for us not to feel complete despair. Do you kill Alan and leave Saga alive? If so, does her daughter get to live? What about Casey? Do you kill both the main characters just to be sure? And if you do, even though you destroy the Dark Presence with it, didn't it win? It's not how the game ends. The ending is written and there's no player choice. But just contemplating it really made me feel a sense of dread I didn't know. It was probably the feeling of another, one stuck with an ending that needs to feel earned, where any semblance of hope and joy might come at the cost of what the story is about. You can't give too much comfort, because horror is about the fact that the statement everything is going to be okay is a lie. About the fact that comfort is often a lie. You can't promise it because you're not in control. What I felt in that moment, those conflicting ideas and debates, is probably exactly what was going on in Alan and Sam Lake's mind. At that point, there was no frontier between the player, the character, and the writer. It's a connection initiated through fantastic writing. That's the pinnacle of the meta horror of Alan Wake 2. What a profound experience it was. Even though the story kind of gives you a good ending. Well, a maybe good, maybe bad ending. Just getting there was amazing. It showed me I didn't understand horror as a genre. This game ended up being my teacher. So, I think Sam Lake is a genius. He can make you feel the infinite and the small. He can make you feel like you can draw dotted lines over pure chaos. His poetry and sense of style give us something special. This essay really was about the ways he crafts atmospheres and stories that profoundly convey their themes both directly and indirectly. And because of that, I didn't get to praise some of the amazing moments Remedy concocted for us. Maybe the fantastical musical sequence that feels like an ascended version of what we got in control, or a great introspective ending to Saga's story in the dark place. These will always stay with me. Sadly, I followed the rules of my genre, and essays demand a thesis that is supported. They demand a direction, a chain of thoughts that each builds upon the last. And if I want this moment to be earned, I must be true to the genre. And so, now that my case rests before you, this video must end. But if you want a truly good ending to this video, please go play Alan Wake 2. And if you already did, which is more probable, please convince someone else to play it. The type of game this level of artistic integrity and depth, this is what our medium needs. Those who shine a light on what sometimes feel like a world filled with victims and monsters.